Hello again, Andrew Dunkley here, the host of Space Nuts. Hope you're well and Merry Christmas uh, and a Happy New Year. This will be our last show for 2022. I think we're going to put in some of our favourite episodes uh, to cover the gap between now and uh, our next real episode. Uh, but uh, we've got a lot to talk about today uh, and a, um, a, an enigma involving our Milky Way galaxy has been solved. So we'll tell you all, all about that and there may be a solution to the dark matter problem. Maybe. If we can figure out what we're talking about, you might understand what we're talking about too. <laughs> Plus audience questions and we have got a little Christmas surprise for you right at the end. So uh, I'm not going to give too much away, but I, I want to send a shout out to Paul and say thank you for... Um, sending it through and I hope you don't mind if we embarrass the almighty hell out of you Paul that's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts 15 seconds guidance is internal 10 9 ignition sequence start Space Nuts 5 Space Nuts astronauts report it feels good and we're joined, as always, by his good self, astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Fancy seeing you here. Yes, it's odd, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. I'm sure, no, it's people good to see you. I'm sure, people tune in thinking it's going to be someone different every week. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we're disappointingly always the same, really, aren't we? We're very regular. Uh, yeah, yeah, I um, we eat a lot of fibre. I've been um, spending some time this past week uh trying to uh look into the details of the former australian astronomical observatory library oh. which has been uh sadly orphaned uh for a number of years because libraries are not what they used to be um and so i've spent a lot of time in the bowels of this library and one of the things i found was this book uh which i'll hold up i don't know whether you can read that it's it is um, one of the memoirs of the British Astronomical Association called Artificial Earth Satellites. Oh. And it was published in 1961. The reason why I brought it home is because it's got pictures of people that I knew and worked with when they were very young uh, back in 1961. But what was, what's really interesting about it is the, you know, there's all this excitement about observing uh, these artificial uh, satellites, which I think when this was published, numbered four in number. <laughs> uh, so um, they were, I, I think they would have been a bit astonished uh, mm. to look forward all these decades. Actually, one of them, I think, is still around. I think uh, one of my friends from the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh is still probably doing this sort of stuff uh, to see, you know, we've got 6,000 operational satellites yeah. in orbit and probably many more that are defunct. Well, there, yeah, so um, blast from the there have been two 2,000 satellite launches this year alone. It, it's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. And most of those have been SpaceX Starlink satellites. Mm, exactly. And, of course, so, Amazon's yeah. going to get into it yep. next year. So yep, that's right. right. Um, yep. We'll soon be able to walk around the planet up there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Just a satellite hop from one to another. Easy peasy. Mm. Easy peasy. That's right. Okay, let's uh, get down to it. And one of uh, our galaxy's uh, unsolved mysteries is no longer unsolved, and that is uh, to do with the small satellite galaxies that um, are, are nearby. And uh, the, the problem has been for decades they've gone, hang on, this just doesn't add up and it doesn't um, you know, fit in with the cosmological model. And you know, what is going on here? They've, um, they've found the answer. Apparently they have. Um uh, these are scientists in a number of universities, including uh, the University of Durham in the north of England and the University of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, um, it, you're right. This is a more a cosmological problem than a galaxy evolution problem. By cosmology, I mean the you know the evolution and origin of the universe as a whole. Uh, so when you model the cosmic web, which is what we think the structure of the universe is like on very large scales, this sort of honeycomb formed by galaxies and sheets of galaxies at the end. When you model that um, and look at the way galaxies evolve within that structure, you would expect uh, the satellite galaxies that are formed around big galaxies like our own, and our own Milky Way has quite a large number of satellite galaxies, of which the two brightest and, and uh, biggest are the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, which mm. we see from down here in the southern hemisphere but when when you when you do the modeling you expect these satellite galaxies to be sort of swarming around uh, their 
you know, what you might call their parent galaxies uh, in, uh, in, in a roughly spherical kind of swarm. But it's not like that with our Milky Way galaxy um, because these uh, smaller galaxies uh, uh, basically have an alignment. Um, they, they seem to sit in a plane rather than in a, in a sphere of material. So if you imagine a, 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 a disc of these galaxies uh, going around our own galaxy. Oh, uh, like, the, like the rings of Saturn type scenario. Yeah, exa- that's exactly right. That's mm. a good a- analogue. I was struggling to find one, but you've hit on a very good one there mm. because uh, the rings of Saturn are made of individual particles and you might wonder why they're not just spread around in a sphere around Saturn, but they're not. They're in a you know, blade-like plane, yeah. uh, which comes about because of Saturn's gravitational pull. Uh, but the same is true in our own galaxy. And uh, in fact, we know that the two Magellanic clouds are being pulled apart by tidal forces exerted on them by the Milky Way galaxy. But they do both lie effectively in this plane. Um, and there's a string of material called the, the Magellanic, what's it called? Not the Magellanic Bridge, something like that. Magellanic Stream, stream of material that's being torn off them that also sits in this plane. And so um, what has been a, a problem for cosmologists has been looked at in detail by these astronomers. And as I mentioned, one of them is uh, Professor Carlos Frank, who I worked with many, many years ago when I used to be an astronomer in the UK. In fact, he once offered me a job, um, <laughs> which I don't think he was entitled to do, but he, let me put it this way, he encouraged me very strongly to apply for it because uh, they couldn't find anybody else. Yeah. So, don't, so, you love, don't you love a job office like that? Will yeah. you apply for this job? No one else will. <laughs> uh, that was exactly what it was. That was exactly the way the conversation went. Oh, dear. Actually, I, I've got um, uh, Carlos, uh, as you might expect from his name, is a very uh, striking gentleman uh, of Latin American origin. Uh, and um, uh, I I once uh, was in the BA lounge, I think, in at, at Heathrow Airport, and I... I, th- I saw this gentleman who was the image of Carlos. And I went up to him and said, hello, Carlos, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for years. And he had no idea what I was talking about <laughs> and said, uh, my name's Frank or something, you know, or George. I can't remember. But but the, the penny dropped um, really for me uh, after he sort of shooed me away thinking, who oh, is this loony? Um, when I realised that this guy looked like Carlos Frank did the last time I saw him 20 years earlier. Oh, right. Isn't it <laughs> and, funny how your brain does that? Yeah. My brain hadn't updated no. my mental image of Carlos. Yeah. So, and if you're listening to this, Carlos, hello. I hope I'm reporting your work accurately. Because, Whatever you look like. Yes, to cut to the chase. Um, Carlos and his colleagues have essentially discovered that um, the the, the disk-like formation of these satellites, uh, and and I should add that you see this in other galaxies as well, not just just in our own. Um, It's something that uh, sort of happens almost automatically when you run your simulations very accurately. Um, and it, and it's it's something to do with the distances of these satellites from the center of the of the galaxy, uh, and I guess what they were perhaps doing is putting them all at the same distance, which would make your satellites look like a, a sphere uh, mm. of stuff around. Whereas if you put them at their differing distances. Uh, then the interactions between them, the gravitational interactions between them and with the galaxy tends to pull them into a disk. So it's a kind of natural uh, consequence of this, uh, of, of, you know, of this um, s- uh, arrangement of satellites that has been seen as a, a mystery before, um, as, uh, as the phys.org article says, uh, describing this, there's no known physical mechanism that would make satellites 
planes. Um, and so they should be in a round configuration, but it's by putting in this additional ingredient into the mix when you do the the analysis of the simulations of this. And I have to say, Carlos is one of the great leaders in, in the world in doing cosmological simulations. They've got a, essentially a model universe in their computers in the University of Durham there. Uh, so they can test all these things, but yeah, it turns out um, that uh, it, it's, it's effectively a chance alignment, which comes and goes. Um, and in fact, um, Carlos, there's a nice quote from Carlos here. He said, the strange alignment of the Milky Way satellite galaxies in the sky had perplexed astronomers for decades, so much so that it was deemed to pose a profound challenge to cosmological orthodoxy. In other words, have we got it all wrong? Yeah. Um, but thanks to the amazing data from the Gaia satellite, so that's another thing that's gone into the mix here, and the laws of physics, we now know that the plane is just a chance alignment a matter of being in the right place at the right time, just as the constellations of stars in the sky are. Come back in a billion years, and that plane will have disintegrated, as will today's constellations. Uh -huh. We have been able to remove one of the main outstanding challenges to the cold dark matter theory of the universe. It continues to provide a remarkably faithful description of the evolution of our universe. Yeah, it's uh, very nice stuff. So what he's basically saying is what we're seeing is unusual, but also normal, and it will sort itself out. Yes, that's right. And it happens kind of everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that maybe you could think of as a, a natural consequence of the evolution of galaxies. When you put them into the context of the, the galaxies that, surrounding, that they surround them, you, you know, when you study galaxies, you've really got to think of them in their, in their environment rather than individually, because that definitely affects the way the gas motions behave within the galaxies and star formation takes place and things of that sort. I've got many colleagues here in Australia who work on this topic, and I'm all, my mind is always blown by the details of what goes on, yeah. you know, the feedback mechanisms that are present in the e evolution of galaxies. It's fabulous stuff. Yeah. Isn't it great to be able to just, you know, find a story that says, okay, this was weird, but now we think it's just normal. So, you know, let's not worry about it anymore. It's all solved. It doesn't yeah, that's happen right. often. Yeah. Um, I, you can bet your life somebody will come along. <laughs> Knock it on the head. Say, uh, but I'll say, but, ah, but have you thought of... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, almost. It'll probably be a, it'll probably be a Space Nuts listener as well. Yeah, almost, <laughs> almost guaranteed. Almost guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, but if you want to read that story, it's on the phys.org website. It's currently on astronomydaily.io if you want to rip in there and have a look at it as well, along with all the other stories that pop up there. Uh, this is Space Nuts, our last episode of the season. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Roger, you're allowed to turn here also. Space Nuts. Now to another um, mysterious thing in the universe that has defied logic and certainly defied our attempts to resolve, and that is dark matter. But now they may have, again, found a solution. There's been all sorts of theories pitched as to what dark matter could be or why it exists or how it exists. This is another one, but it, this one sounds like it holds water or light. <laughs> As the case may be. <laughs> or dark. Or dark. Dark light. <laughs> yeah. Dark light, that's right. Um, yeah. It, it, so just recapping briefly, of course, the dark matter problem is one that occupies the minds of most astrophysicists and cosmologists that we, we see evidence everywhere, uh, and not just in the rotation of galaxies, but that's one well-known example. We see evidence everywhere that there is some constituent of the universe that has gravitational attraction, but nothing else. It doesn't interact in any other way with the, uh, with the contents of the universe. So it's being identified as some species or set of species of subatomic particles mm. that have mass, but don't interact in any other way. And it, which are fundamental in actually creating the framework within which galaxies formed and stars and planets and ultimately human beings. So it's very important and very and embarrassing that astronomers don't actually know what it is. Uh, so this is a, a, a new tack, at least it's new to me. Um, I haven't come across this work before or this uh, suggestion. Um, there's a 
large number of uh, institutions involved in this research, including the International School of Advanced Studies, whose press release I'm reading. Uh, but they've also collaborated with astronomers in Tel Aviv, Nottingham, UK and New York, uh, where uh, there is a lot of interest in this topic. So um, it goes back to observations. And it's always nice when you find a new theory or a new idea that's linked directly with observations. And the Hubble Space Telescope has on board something called the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. And that basically uh, looks at the structure of the cosmic web. This is this network of filaments of galaxies that, uh, that there is, uh, and the, the spaces in between, the kind of honeycomb structure that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah. So when you look at the, these data, uh, I think we talked about these filaments a few months ago with the, the idea that some of them are actually rotating. Uh, I don't know whether you remember that, but we, yeah, I do. we, we, we featured uh, rotating filaments in Space Nuts. Um, that links so that the, the fact that you can observe the behavior of these filaments in some detail um, comes uh, down to uh, some another detail that has been observed by these scientists, which is that when you look at uh, the data from the cosmic origin spectrograph, you find that these filaments are hotter than they are predicted to be by models built on the sort of standard model of galactic structure formation or universe structure formation. Now, by hotter, uh, scientists or physicists certainly uh, usually mean um, more active in terms of the speed of the atoms that are that are making them up the filaments uh so you, if you remember temperature is just a a measure certainly here on earth it's a measure of of the rapidity of the motion of atoms in a for example in a in a lump of something or uh the way you know the way uh water boils you can sort of envisage when you look in a boiling pot of water that the atoms are moving around quite a lot yes. so that, that it's the motion of the atoms that is signifies the temperature and i think what they're saying here is that these filaments contain uh, subatomic particles probably that that are in much more rapid motion than you might expect in other words they are they are hotter mm. uh, in that sort of sense uh, and there is, but there is a way out of this issue uh, if you postulate that dark matter has multiple uh, constituents, a bit like normal matter has, you know, when we think of all the, the, the zoo of particles that, that make up normal matter, maybe dark matter is like that as well. And one of the constituents that they postulate is dark photons, um, which may actually have heated up the universe in its early stages. Uh, dark photons being uh, a dark matter equivalent of of bright photons, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm going to make read a quote from uh, one of the authors, uh, Andrea Caputo, uh, who's at CERN, which of course is a good place to, to think about subatomic particles. Sure is. And uh, Tel Aviv University. Andrea says dark photons are hypothetical new particles that are the force carriers for a new force in the dark sector, much like the photon is the force carrier for electromagnetism. So we think of photons as being particles of light, but they're actually the force carrier for, for magnetism as well. Um, I beg your pardon, that's a quote from, uh, actually it's, it's several of the authors, so it's, it's uh, as you'd expect, because this is in a press release. Yeah. It includes uh, James Bolton of the University of Nottingham, as well as others. Anyway, the comment that they go on to say is, unlike the photon, uh, these dark photons can have mass. In particular, the ultralight dark photon, with a mass as small as 20 orders of magnitude less than that of the electron, this is vanishingly small, Andrew, yeah. uh, is a good candidate for dark matter. Um, and so what they're suggesting is that the dark photons and the normal photons are sort of expected to mix uh, in, in an analogue of the way different sorts of neutrinos mix. 
Uh, and what they're su suggesting is that dark photon, dark matter might be converted into low frequency photons that might heat up the cosmic web. And that's why you get these hot filaments. Um, but it, it's something that you can't really observe because it involves dark matter. Yeah. So uh, it's a complicated story. It is. Um, I, I read the entire article in phys.org and, I, and I, I think I'd have to read it three or four times to wrap my head around it. And even then I might find that I'm coming up short. But as you said, it's a, it, this is a theory. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing about theories is you've then got to be able to come up with ways of trying to prove your theory correct. How would you do that in this case? Well, so that, this is a start um, by uh, what, what the, the plan is, in a sense, is to use the whole universe as what we call a calorimeter, something that me measures the amount of heat. Um, and if you can find that there's more heat in the universe than you think there should be yeah. from the standard model, then you know there's something missing. And these scientists are postulating that is the effect of these dark photons, the, the, the fact that it's mixing with the normal photons uh, and producing what turns out to be the energy required, as it quotes in the uh, phys.org, uh, sorry, quoting again the phys.org article, uh, what you get is the energy required to reconcile the discrepancy between observations and simulation. Um, and so they, su they suggest that this will actually drive more theoretical and observational in investigations uh, in order to explore the exciting possibility that the dark photon could constitute could, could constitute the dark matter. Now, I'm a bit puzzled by this, Andrew, as you might oh, good. have guessed. Good, because <laughs> I yeah. certainly am. I mean, the we've we've kind of gone along and, I, and i'm not a particle physicist so i i flounder with some of this stuff but we've basically um assumed that whatever dark matter particles are they are more massive than their standard matter counterparts uh like anti neutrino or neutralinos they're called not anti neutrinos neutralinos are, mm. uh, are thought to be uh, one possibility for dark matter uh, neutrinos uh but so, but you expect them to be heavier or to be more massive than their normal matter counterparts because dark matter makes up what is it five sixths of the of the matter in the universe? It outweighs normal matter by five to one. Yeah, and so you think they're they're heavy, but we're hearing here that dark photons are very small, uh, or in terms of their mass, a mass as small as 20 orders of magnitude, less than that of the electron. So maybe there's uh, just squillions more of them. There's just squillions more of them. That's really the only thing you can assume from that. Yeah. But, yeah, it, isn't it an interesting insight, the idea that there might be dark photons which uh, which make up yes. uh, some of the matter in the universe? Can, and I, I, can I, I throw in a curveball? Yes, please do. I read an article yesterday that said that they are puzzled by a discovery that there is more light in the universe than there should be, and they can't account for it. <laughs> I'm seeing that one. Yeah. yeah. Could that, you, you know, go. could we put these two lots together and say, oh, oh, join the dots? Could be it. Well, um, that could be the uh, the, do the, the, the smoking the gun. Theory. The smoking Dunkley theory. <laughs> Uh, because well, um, that just goes up in flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like lithium batteries, apparently. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so yes, um, yeah, 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 and the, you can be sure that there'll be scientists who, who whose minds are across all this stuff in a way that certainly mine isn't. <laughs> Yours yeah. might be, but mine isn't. Um, uh, and we'll, yeah, we'll actually, um, we'll, we'll actually put the join the dots, and we may, yeah, there may be more. There may be more stuff on this soon, which would be great. It's such a, uh, you know, it, it, I think this in itself is a curveball. Something dark photons coming in from nowhere uh, is a, certainly a new idea to me and mm. I think is quite quite exciting. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, it's got to be something. I mean, that's, <laughs> be something. Such, that's such an right. obvious statement. So coming up with uh, fresh ideas, maybe something out of left field like this is worth investigating. And uh, if yeah, it does dark. correlate with the extra light in the universe that's unaccounted for, you know, I'll, I'll happily fly wherever I need to fly to get my Nobel Prize. 
Uh, well, let's put it on record friends. now. Don't and forget your friends when you do. I won't. No, you can. You can. Come. It'll be too heavy for just me. You can. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the, that would be good. I, I think that would be a, a very satisfactory outcome from the Space Nuts if you got and, a Nobel Prize. Yeah, it might double our audience to two listeners. <laughs> always a possibility it, it is indeed yeah but once again if you'd like to look at that story uh it's on fizz.org under the headline scientists find new hints that dark matter could be made up of dark photons so uh yeah um check that one out it is really fascinating uh it's a it's a tough read but uh, only for me i think you'll find it quite easy <laughs> this is space nuts with andrew dunkley and fred watson Zero G and I feel fine. space nuts now, Fred, to what is always our favourite part of the show, and that is uh, sharing it with the audience and getting them to contribute via questions. Uh, we're going to do a few questions, and we've got plenty of time, which is good, uh, but we're also <laughs> going to throw in a, a bit of a curveball um, from uh, from Paul, who's uh, sent in something Christmassy for us. I think he did something similar last year or, you know, sometime in the past, but it might not have been Christmas, but uh, I've got a recollection that he did something. Uh, so let's firstly go to a question from William. Hey, Andrew and Fred. This is William from Toronto, Canada. I have a question about radio waves and Bluetooth. If I'm wearing a Bluetooth earbud that's no more than two centimeters across, how is it able to pick up and send radio wave frequencies if it's so small? and radio wave wavelengths are so large. Thank you. Wow. Well, I, I never even considered that. Yeah, they're about two centimetres, which is, yeah. you know, um, what a, just shy of an inch for yeah, people who indeed. live in countries that, where they don't know how yeah, to properly measure things. Inch. Yeah. Inch. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good question. It is a good question. And isn't Bluetooth fantastic? Oh, it is Australian makes... invention, wasn't it? Uh, that no, was no, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, I think. Wi-Fi was, yeah. yeah. I think um, Bluetooth, if I remember, comes from Finland. Yeah, it was named and named after a Viking. A, that's right, named, yes. Whose yes. name was Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm. So, yeah, it is incredible. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, William's question is a great one because we think of, um, you know, antennas, uh, like the stuff that's on the roof of your house, if you've still got one on the roof of your house. I have. With, with, the, uh, with the dipoles, the, um, uh, you know, the, basically the, the, the bits of metal that sense the, the radio frequency waves. Uh, we're used to seeing things like that. Um, and it, in fact, that's actually quite a good analogue because the UHF band, uh, which is what uh, ultra-high frequency it stands for, that's what uh, these TV things usually are, typically, um, is the, the is the band of the Bluetooth network. It's uh, frequencies from 2.402 to 2.48 gigahertz, um, which is the same sort of wave band. It, I did a quick calculation in my head before we started talking, and I think that means they've got a wavelength around 10 centimeters or thereabouts, a bit a bit less, a bit more perhaps, but something along those lines. <coughs> Excuse me. Now. That does not, though, necessarily mean that you need a 10 centimetre long antenna to detect them um, because uh, you only need an antenna that is smaller than that wavelength uh, so that it can actually pick up the variations in the field strength, the electrical field strength uh, or electromagnetic field strength, to do it, put it correctly, uh, that that is happening as these waves wash over you, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So it's like having, you know, a, a buoy, uh, or I think in Canada it's called a buoy, actually. So since we're talking to Toronto, uh, uh, my wife lived in Canberra for a long time and she always calls them buoys. Mm. Uh, so a buoy, uh, which was British expression, of course, and Australian, I think, yeah. uh, uh, floating on the ocean. Uh, as you think of it, when, when a wave goes past, that, that goes up and down. And so it's a similar situation with the antenna of your Bluetooth device. It's just sensing the variation in electromagnetic field strength as the radio frequency waves go past. There you go. Um, uh, it would be more of a problem if you're 
Bluetooth device was bigger than the wavelength of the uh, of the signal that you're looking for, because then I think it would start to fall over. Yeah, interesting. I just had a thought. Uh, if you could flick a switch on the side of your head and turn your eyes into, um, you know, give them the ability to see all the radio waves that were being emitted at the moment. Oh, would, yeah. Would you basically be looking like you're being attacked by a spirograph? Like, would you just see squiggles in all directions all the time? Yeah, you would. You'd, you'd be, I mean, it, yeah, you'd be, it would be like being immersed in the ocean with waves of different frequencies going past you in different directions. I mean, it would be, it would be extraordinary to be able to do that. Yeah. I think it might drive you slightly mad, though. I reckon it might, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly yeah. affect your driving. Well, mm. yes, if you could see all that while you were driving, yeah, that would be terrible. Would. <laughs> see all the Bluetooth coming out of your radio and all the rest of it. Yes. Okay, thank you, William. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, I like this one. This comes from David. Hello, Fred and Andrew. This is David from San Marcos, Texas. Go Bobcats. Uh, <laughs> question. I was watching a documentary on the Saturn's moon Mimas and the impact crater on it, which is approximately 130 kilometers across. And it showed a computer representation of the impact. And it showed a wave of dust cloud going across the surface, but it also showed a lot of fiery red soot and ash and even fire in the cloud. Um, I was wondering how was that able to light on fire or cause sparks like that in space when there is no oxygen. Um, confused me by watching it. Uh, love the show, guys. Uh, Merry Christmas and salutations to any aliens out there listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, your question impresses me. I'm even more impressed that you referred to kilometres. Uh, that, yeah, wow. Uh, but um, I, my first thought is, does Mimus have an atmosphere? Could that account for it? It's um, too small and ah. it doesn't, doesn't have an atmosphere. It, uh, it's, there are squillions of moons in that vicinity, yeah, aren't there? That's right, yeah. Uh, it's one of the bigger ones um, and it's a one, it is really extraordinary. I can't remember what the crater's called actually, which is terrible. I'll but, look it up. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like um, uh, Mars's moon Phobos oh, as a crater. Yeah. Uh, which I can remember its name. It's Stickney, it's called, uh, and that uh, is kind of takes up half the half of one hemisphere of Phobos. And Mimas or Mimas is is much the same. It's got this enormous dent in it. It's the image of the Death Star from uh, from Star Wars. You, you're going to kick yourself. It's called Herschel Crater. Oh, that's it, Herschel. Yeah, yeah. what a good name. <laughs> I, I think it's got an, another name in brackets: uh, Mimantian Crater. There you go. Yeah. That's, yeah. Anyway, it's it's a big crater, and yes, it would have been formed by an impact, as was Stickney on uh, Phobos. Um, but it, uh, look, David asks a good question because, um, you know, in a sense, I, I guess what I'd point towards is, uh, although it's slightly different, but it's got similar overtones, um, the, the fact that the sun is shining very brilliantly, looking like a fiery ball, and yet there's no oxygen around it. Mm. Um, and so what you're talking about is just gas that is heated to such a high temperature that it becomes luminous itself. Uh, so that is like, so they are flames, but they're flames that are kind of, you know, they cause differently from the oxygen reactions that give rise to flames on Earth. This is just stuff that's been heated, superheated, actually, by the energy of the impact. Uh, and essentially, the rock is vaporized. Uh, and because it's pushed up to such a high temperature, uh, that that um, vapor is excited to, to um, you know, to, 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 to be luminous. Uh, a bit like the photosphere of the sun is, is luminous. It's uh, Hot hydrogen is what you're seeing there when you when you look at the sun's surface. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a um, a factor of heat. Yeah. Um, we to to be slightly more technical, we call it black body radiation. So uh, any object that has a temperature radiates uh, electromagnetic waves. We do actually. Um, you and I, as we're sitting here, uh, we're radiating in the infrared wave band, if I remember rightly, with a wavelength of about 10 microns. Okay. Uh, 10 thousandths of a millimetre. Oh, 10 millionths of a... 10 millionths of a... Um, 
10 millionths of a meter. <laughs> Let me get it right. <laughs> so, but yeah, but what I was going to say was if you take any body, uh, uh, any object, and that includes a cloud of gas and heat it, uh, so that its black body spectrum shifts uh, into the visible. It's akin to, you know, a red hot poker. It's red while it's at reasonably high temperatures, but you put it in and heat it up even more, it becomes white hot. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of what's happening to the gas. It's black body radiation from the gas. Okay. There you go, David. Simple answer, really. <laughs> Which is not common in this segment, but anyway. No, no. In fact, any answer at all isn't common in this <laughs> segment, really. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, go the Bobcats. Yes. Uh, now, um, let's go to our next question. Uh, the uh, questioner needs no introduction. <laughs> Hello, Space Nuts. Martin Berman Gorvine here, your favorite science fiction writer pest. Let me be the first to ask you what the reported breakthrough in nuclear fusion might mean for space travel. Since Fred poured cold heavy water all <laughs> over the idea of bussard ramjets for interstellar travel, what are the chances of fusion powered interplanetary travel where the spaceship carries the hydrogen fuel with it instead of scooping it up from the thin interstellar medium like Robert Bussard proposed? becoming possible within a generation or so. Come on, man. I want to buy my ticket to Europa, at least by the time I'm Shatner's age. Norman <laughs> Gorbine, over and out. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Yeah, we did tip a bit of water on his uh, buzzard ramjet idea. Uh, and the other day we talked about the uh, successful experiment to create uh, fusion power using a laser. So more power is created than energy used to create the power. Uh, so that's got Martin thinking, well, why can't we go with fusion motors? Uh, I like the I – like, well, I always like Martin's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's outside the uh, box. Yeah, it's outside the box. Um, so – the way I think I'd gravitate towards this idea, and yes, it's certainly something that might be applicable to interstellar, interplanetary travel, um, is to, uh, we don't know how big a, a, a useful fusion reactor is going to turn out to be um, when they start really fabricating them in such a way that you can get more energy out properly than you can put in. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the one that we reported on the other day is it's a tiny pellet of material that it uh, that it focuses these and i can't remember how many lasers 30 or something lasers onto it uh which take a lot of power themselves to convert it to uh, to the energy that's required to to create the fusion it's uh deuterium and tritium i think that that the the um, fusion pellet was made of anyway um what what if you if you're limited by you know, the fact that you've got really big stuff that needs to be the size of a power station on Earth in order to uh, make your fusion electricity. I think what you might think about doing is using solar sails powered by ground-based lasers or something of that sort, mm. which would uh, b be blown along by the laser light created itself by fusion energy, so very cheap energy to blow along your spacecraft. Um, if you can make them small enough, yeah, you could you could – have a little power source in your, in your, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Xenon plasma rocket. Yeah. So, you know, so you, you squirt out a plasma out of the back and accelerate it to enormous energies, uh, because of the, uh, because of the cheap power that you've got in space. So you've also got solar power, which is pretty cheap too. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, that might not be competitive. Uh, but yeah, look, um, yeah. <laughs> I hope you'll be less than Shatner's age before you get your ticket to Europa. That, uh, that could be hard for Martin because I think that's next week. But anyway, carry uh, on. <laughs> yeah, certainly pretty near for me. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to be putting my name down just quite yet until there's a bit more certainty about it all. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, thanks for the question again, Martin. Always good to hear from you. Indeed it is. And uh, thanks for – look, Martin sent me another book. Um, oh, did he? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. This yeah, one is called The Long Morning of Heartwood. Now, I think it's a short story because it's, it's only little, you know, it's a thin book. It's a very thin book. I don't know how he got it published with 25 pages, but there it is. 
Mm, so I, um, I haven't started that yet because I've got to finish his other one, which I'm, I'm getting around to. I'm reading so many at once. It's not a very good idea. should read one and go to the next, but I've got three on the go at the moment. Uh, now I've got four. But, yeah, well, that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah. but we're, we're going on holiday, so I'll, I'll take them with me. And, um, and then I hope we'll have a formal review of them. Oh, from, for sure. Uh, space Nuts, yes. yes I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that. And I'm still reading Obi's book about uh, the future of space travel, so um, I'll, I'll do a review on that. I've actually already done a review on Amazon for him. So, oh, great. Uh, mm. Well done. <laughs> now, there is one more thing before we um, conclude. Now, my apologies for ducking off screen all the time. I, I've, um, I've decided to stop taking my hay fever medication. <laughs> and uh, I think I stopped too soon, and I'm starting yes, to probably. find it a bit of a problem. But um, just felt the need to share that. Now, well, let's, um, now, now um, this, this is something that's come from Paul Keane. Paul is uh, an uber fan of Space Nuts, and he wants to get all the Space Nuts audience into the Christmas spirit. Are you ready for this, Fred? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, well, that's probably the right answer. <laughs> is Paul. Yeah, Paul. Oh my goodness! Yes. It's classic. That, uh, speaking of out of the box, uh, that was yeah, right yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I, I love the. Well, it's a ballad, really, isn't it? It is. The, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it sounds story. like there was a very sad ending where you got dumped by Santa and couldn't get home. But yeah, there was something like that. Yes, yes. that's yes. right. Thank you, Paul. That is um, that is wonderful. We appreciate it. Gosh, that's nice. Uh, and I um, hope you and your family have a wonderful Christmas. And I'd like to send a shout-out to all the uh, Space Nuts audience for supporting us, and thank you for um, your um, constant interest in what Fred and I have to talk about uh, and some of the things that we've done this year. Uh, I suppose, Fred, um, I don't know, story of the year for you? What do you reckon? James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm kind of, what, there's been so many. James Webb Space yeah. Telescope, the DART mission. Yeah. That kind of was special. No, Artemis, Artemis, Artemis one, 1, um, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah I'll tell a, a little factoid that uh, I love, Andrew, is that on the 10th of December, um, Ingenuity completed its 36th flight on the surface of Mars. Wow. Uh, exactly 600 days after its first flight. That's Isn't amazing. Brilliant? Yeah. Fantastic. So there's another going. thing. Uh, I forgot about that, Ingenuity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although that was 
last year, I think it started flying, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, February um, last year. When, but it's still when going, it well past yeah. its use-by date, which yeah. is extraordinary. Five flights was what they expected. The other thing that's popped up in the last day or so is Insight has sent a message yes, saying, so, yeah. bye-bye, I'm going to sleep, bye-bye. I don't think I can do any more, but I've had a great time and see yeah. you later. So yeah. that Insight's so, just about finished. A real tearjerker. Indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, um, so thank you to uh, everybody for listening and supporting us, especially our patrons on Patreon and Supercast who have um, put their money into Space Nuts uh, as, as a gesture of goodwill. We, we are forever grateful. Uh, also, thank you to our podcasting platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts, um, iTunes, Google Podcasts, uh, Podbean, uh, Stitcher, Gosh, I don't know how many others who who carry us, but we are uh, ever thrilled. Um, I, th- I, I wish I could remember them all, but there are so many. Uh, and uh, just our, our sponsors in general who've been supporting us uh, for a, a few years now. That is um, that is wonderful, uh, and we we so much appreciate it. So uh, thank you, and a special thank you to you, Fred, because without you, this this would be nothing. And um, <laughs> You know, you, you, you really are just a fantastic bloke and so oh, thank you. easy That's to work nice. with and I'm very, very grateful to have you in, a, in my professional life for so long and... Well, that's um, entirely reciprocated, Andrew, yeah. uh, because uh, without you, it wouldn't have happened either. So there you go. Yeah. And I think, um, if I'm counting correctly, I think we are on the brink of starting season eight of Space Nuts. Is I that can't. Right? Yeah, I don't I think this sure. must have been seven because we've been going for, well, yeah, seven years pretty well. Yeah, it must be. We'd be <laughs> we'd be pushing it. I, I honestly haven't done the numbers. Uh, speaking of numbers, I, I think um, our download numbers are, are pushing up around the thirty thousand a week mark, or something to that effect. That's Incredible nice. numbers. That's a, that's a million and a half a year. Yeah, is, I think it's something like that. Um, that's fabulous. I'll get a message from that's Hugh fabulous. now saying, "No, no, that's thirty thousand every ten years." Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So we're Sounds nearly good, at, nearly at thirty thousand downloads. No, it's it's yeah. good. They're good numbers, and um, yeah, and it's all thanks to the audience for supporting us. I think we're either number one or number two in the science section of iTunes very regularly. So lovely. that is that is just lovely to know. Um, and and thank you again. Thank you, Fred. Um, it's time to wrap it up for this year. What we're going to do uh, over the coming weeks is we're going to run some of our. Um, uh, probably m- more significant episodes, not s- necessarily our favourite ones, but some of them. So James Webb, Artemis, Dart, uh, a few Q&A episodes that will cover us for the next few weeks. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be back as soon as I would like, but that's because I've um, we've got a little holiday and then I've got to go and have something done in hospital, which, you know, I, I can't put off any longer. So that's just going to keep me on the lowdown for a, a, a few weeks, but uh, we'll be back late January, early Feb at this stage, all things being equal. But, Fred, um, Merry Christmas to you and Marnie and uh, Happy New Year, and thanks for doing what you do. Um, I love it. I know everyone else does. <laughs> and to you too and Judy, uh, Andrew, and your family. Uh, have a great festive season, uh, and we'll look forward to catching up in the new year. Maybe beginning of February sounds perfect. It'll be around then. All right, thanks, Fred. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, and from Hugh back in the studio, thank you so much for supporting Space Nuts and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we look forward to catching up with you in 2023. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.